I've often said like weak men want weak women. Mm -hmm. Um, the fact that she was so strong willed and stubborn and was attractive, uh, beyond the physical, she caught me at the low point of my adult life. It is certainly an easier relationship being married to someone who understands all the, Mm -hmm. the sacrifices and the difficulties and the crappy hours, which is part of it. Because even though we don't have all those extra things to worry about, there's still the fact of housework has to get done, laundry has to get done, meals have to get cooked, day-to-day business of a household still has to get done. And I'm not there to pull my end of the deal, Mm. but he's got to take up on it. It's a strong woman who helps a man be strong, but at the same time, it's a strong man who helps a woman be strong. Take a girl and a guy and they fall madly in love and form a family. Sprinkle in some counseling degrees and a doctorate, a dream of transforming relationships as we know it. And 20 years later, we give you power couple Dr. Ray and Jean Ketkodian. And this is their podcast, Couples Synergy. Welcome back to another episode of Couples Synergy with Dr. Ray and Jean. I'm Dr. Ray. And I'm Jean. And this is our podcast about love, life, and relationships. Check us out online at couplesynergy.com and be sure to subscribe to our podcast or send us any suggestions on topics you'd like to hear more about. And now on to Couple Synergy, an in-depth look at love, marriage, and relationships, where we bring you our experiences with working with thousands of couples for over 15 years. You know, every day we get to hear intimate details about a couple's celebrations, disappointments, and everyday challenges. We've often wished these stories were shared because we know we are more similar than different. And so we've created not only an avenue where you can hear about people's intimate lives, but an atmosphere where people come over to our home pub, pour a drink, and share their stories. People like today's guests, Teresa and Mike, how are you guys doing? Great, great. Happy to be here. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. You know, in salute to law enforcement out there, this is a very special show because not only do we have one, but we have a law enforcement couple. That's awesome. Correct. We double the dysfunction. (laughs) (laughs) And I I think also this is probably the first time in in podcast history where a law enforcement couple is in the same room with a psychology couple. (laughs) How about that, huh? We got to go. (laughs) Time has stood still, actually. It has. So before we get to that and talking about a little bit, you know, about relationships and law enforcement, I know there's, I mean, just I'm, we could talk to stats all day. But before we get to that, why don't you guys tell us a little bit uh, about yourselves? How old are you? I am 36, I think. Yes, 36. <laughs> I am 48 for another couple of months. Awesome. And how long have you guys been in, on the police force? I'm in my 26th year. Wow. And I'm in my 14th year. Awesome. That's great. Thank you, guys. Can you guys tell us the story of how you met? (laughs) Sure. Um, We'll see if our versions match up. Uh, I was obviously there. at. uh, We work in the same agency. At the time that you guys met? Yes. That's that's where we met. I was a newer officer, a newer supervisor, not my direct supervisor. We're going to make that clear right now. (laughs) Yep. We we knew each other quite a bit just... Um, working together. He was married. So I was, you know, okay, you're married, you know, good friends, that kind of a thing. And then uh, one day he walked into where we write our reports and he just went, well, my wife just filed for divorce. (laughs) Yes. She's not the homewrecker. We'll get that out of the way. (laughs) And it was just completely out of left field just because he's always been pretty private with his personal life. And I It was me and a couple other guys there, and it was just one of those where you're like, um, sorry, congratulations, I don't know how to handle this. (laughs) And then a couple months later, then we started talking a little bit more, and I realized, wow, he's actually a pretty good guy, and he had hair then, and then... (laughs) This is audio. Yes, I know. My head is shaved now (laughs) for uh, a reason. I don't know whether it was uh, the crisis he was going through at that time, but he had shaved his head and he looked 10 years younger. And I I remember him walking down the hallway and I did a double take. I'm like, hey, how you doing? (laughs) (laughs) And then uh, we just started dating from there. Yeah, slow slow but steady. I I was very interested, but very cautious being a you know, her supervisor 
thought, yeah, she's she's fun, she's cool, she's attractive, but I don't really want to get fired for sexual harassment. No, right. <laughs> yeah, slow but sure. A couple of dinners here and there, and our running joke is she invited me over to the house one day and I never left, and that's not far <laughs> off. <laughs> it is pretty true, actually. Yeah. We actually, he spent the night, a couple nights, and he was living with his parents at the time, and his parents live way out of the way. One day I'm just like, you know, why don't you just bring a uniform and, you know, just kind of just Some changes so, of clothing. Right. So you don't have to, you know, come here, then go to your parents' house and go back to work. And he said, OK. And the next thing I know, he's bringing in garbage bags full of his <laughs> clothes. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. How, how soon into the relationship did that happen? Um, I would say about a week. Uh, no. You're a month in or so. Yeah, about a month. Yeah, I mistook the, yeah, just bring a couple of changes of clothes to any excuse to get out of my parents' house, <laughs> right. you know, in the middle of the divorce. <laughs> well, so. and then and then it was just, at first, the, after the initial shock, then he hung up a, a picture in, a, in my loft area. And I went, well, I guess he's staying if he's hanging pictures. <laughs> and I thought, well, it's a good thing I like him because, you know, this is, <laughs> apparently it's going to be permanent. And then it just... We just clicked from there. Yep. So far, so good. How did, I, how did you guys managed. know you were a couple? That's actually a really good question. Yeah, I don't know. He moved um, in and didn't leave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that. And That's um, one way. <laughs> I'd say an interesting thing that just entered my head is, yeah, I moved in fairly quickly, whether it was anticipated or not. And I was already living there. And Teresa had a friend in Michigan. Mm-hmm. A guy friend that I didn't know. She just said, hey, I'm going to stay with whatever his name is for the weekend. And unbeknownst to me, it was a, like a kind of a prior romantic, pseudo romantic right, yeah. relationship. She came back home after the weekend and it, it didn't go so great for her for mm-hmm. a variety of reasons. She kind of spilled her guts that, hey, this was the nature. I think that was the final test of, is it going to be? Do I want you to stay here or are we going to stay casual or whatever? And I don't know. I think in the, uh, to me, looking back, when you came back and had a, let's just say, less than stellar time with this other guy who had been a friend and kind of completely 100% opened up truthfully of the nature. And um, I didn't take it as a jealous anything. It was kind of the first, you know what, we can get through anything with truth and communication yeah it was the first and to me time. that really solidified okay we're more than just brand new boyfriend girlfriend uh, you know we started with real truths then and not only survived it but got stronger because of it took yeah. you to the next level yes yeah. absolutely and I, I really feel because we did happen quite fast it was one of those things where we went a couple couple dinners here and there and then he moved in and then it was okay you know, I, I couldn't, this, the trip that I had planned in Michigan was planned for, you know, a couple months mm-hmm. and I wasn't completely not truthful with him for the nature of, of the trip, but it was, it was still kind of a, you know, a, Hey, I'm kind of dating other people. And he was cool with it. Cause you know, he was going through his own trauma and his own divorce and all that other stuff. And yeah. It wasn't, I, it wasn't like, how dare you were, were a thing. Right. Right. And it was so new. And when I came back and I did you know, open, it wasn't a great experience for me. It was not a good thing. And and I came back and he was there to comfort me and to really listen to me without judgment. And after that, it was just kind of like, wow, somebody actually is open, openly communicative, didn't take offense to it, didn't take it personally. He's listening to me and he was there for me. And, and I think that's also, that's actually, I forgot, <laughs> forgotten about that <laughs> repressed memory. But yeah, that's, that's really where, you know, we clicked and so you didn't ask him to live with you. You just offered him a place to sort of stay temporarily. Exactly. Got it. And I, I took quite a leap. <laughs> and what was it about the other person that you fell in love with? I would say command presence. He's very strong. He's a very strong person. And Professionally it, and personally. Yes. <laughs> it, yes, exactly. And uh, someone like me, I have a tendency to, you know, be hard-headed. I was raised in a very strong female family where we're empowered to do whatever the heck we want, essentially. And he was able to to keep keep up with me. He was able to be my sounding board. He never, you know, he always encourages. He never discourages unless he thinks it's something that's going to be harmful to me. And he just, that's, you know, one of the most, the most strongest 
qualities that I fell in love with him about is just he was able to keep up with me and not many people can. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I would say by far her strength. I, I've, I've often said like weak men want weak women. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that she was so strong willed and stubborn and was attractive uh, beyond the physical. She caught me at the low point of my adult life. You know, my divorce was kind of a long time coming, you know, you know. How long were you married? 11 years, but truly it was over three years before papers were filed. It was strictly staying together. We for, see that. That's pretty common. Right. Yeah, People for do kids. It a long time. And mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it was over a long time. Once I got hit with the papers and the reality, you know, it was it, undoubtedly a low point. And Teresa really gave me a lot of strength. And I, I had... I was carrying a lot of a lot of guilt and sadness and ironically like flourishing at work because I threw myself a hundred percent into work to not be around my old home life. And that's pretty common too in law enforcement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and some other mischief, but I digress. <laughs> but uh she kind of helped show me that no, it's not all your fault. It doesn't matter what she says and you don't have to always knuckle under because of guilt or and built me up as well. You also accepted responsibility for your actions I, I, in the failure of that marriage. And yes. that was another thing that was very attractive to me. It wasn't all MFing the other person. It wasn't all, it's all her fault. She, he, he came forward and he was very open with me. And he said, look, I screwed up here. I was screwed up here. I screwed up here. They all, they went through counseling. And I always say like, I'm thankful to her because she did all the work to make him a really good spouse, and then I just benefited from it. <laughs> yeah, she got the finished product. <laughs> well, what is different in this relationship versus your other marriage? I think 100% communication about everything. The lessons I learned from the failure of my first one that I tended to swallow my feelings more for just wanting to avoid what I knew was going to be an other argument or banging my head against the wall in the past and not getting through rather than facing an issue, just ignoring it or lashing out through too much drinking or frankly, philandering, you know, things that I can look back now and no regrets. You know, I did, it, it's part of my story who I am now made me where I am today, but it has definitely taught me to, you know, one of the first things we said is we're never going to bed angry We're we may not have an issue a hundred percent resolved, but it's not going to be a volcano waiting to erupt mm -hmm. and because she's so strong-willed. He, he likes to say, <laughs> he's not afraid of conflict and neither am I. I mean, just by nature of our job, you know, right. that's something we deal with and we're not afraid of how each other feels because we know underlying that we always, mm -hmm. we love each other, we respect each other and he likes to say, because apparently what I do when I'm angry or he says something that I don't like, my eyebrows will shoot up Oh yeah, <laughs> and he'll go, put your eyebrows down and talk to me. And that's, uh, that's something that we, you know, we're, we're always, you know, and then we'll say like, after we've had our little tift, whatever it is, disagreement, we don't, we don't fight a whole lot, but we do disagree. Mm -hmm. And when we are, we're done with our disagreement, we'll be like, okay, are we friends now? Can you be my friend now? And that's, you know, that's kind of what, you know, I think is, is fun. It's like, oh, wait, will you be my friend again? I'm like, no, I don't want to be your friend. I love you, but I don't want to be your friend right now. I'm still not done being angry. Were any of your previous relationships uh, in law enforcement? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. I and, was uh, engaged to a law enforcement officer okay. prior to this. And Mike, your ex was not? No. Okay. No. Okay. Yeah. That was it? Was that ever a concern for the two of you, you know, that you guys are are on the job and you're in a relationship together? I don't think so. I, I will say, speaking for me, the fact that she is, it Teresa, helps. Teresa, yeah, it helps. The it, uh, You know, I'm not going to say woe is me. It's hard being, uh, you know, in law enforcement. But it is certainly an easier relationship being married to someone who understands all the... Mm -hmm the sacrifices and the difficulties and the crappy hours, which is part of it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't have any regret by, I, I still love what I do for a living. But my ex-wife, I've had, I've had a lot of success in my career and therefore had a lot of different positions, a lot of different hours. And it was always the hope with her that, oh, well, this will be better now. 
now that you're right. uh, insert position here. You'll be home more. Right. Yeah. And, you know, obviously the more success is the more I had to put in mm -hmm. or the more I was interested in a new position, I would inherently throw myself in it. Especially when the marriage was crappy, like I said, mm -hmm. uh, my my kids were very young when things were starting to fall apart, you know, two years old, three mm -hmm. years old. So at that point, if they weren't awake, I wasn't home. You were working. Yes. Which is what you mentioned, Teresa, that that's kind of part of the job. Yeah. You know, and, and there are statistics out there about law enforcement officers that mm -hmm. they have high rates of divorce, high rates of alcoholism. High rates of, of, you know, infidelity in yes. their in their relationships. Yeah. Suicide. Suicide as well. Yeah. Right. And I will say now he's he's more of in a, a management position and I'm more of a, a working position. I'm a detective and I'm also in a task force. And the task force inherently is unpredictable. The hours are unpredictable because, you know, we don't work in a set schedule. It's whenever a catastrophe happens, mm -hmm. you go. And oftentimes you're stuck. You're working 16 hours a day and you don't know when you're going to be home. You don't know when you are going to be available for things. You have to cancel date nights. You have to cancel things. And and I'm thankful that we don't have very young children because, you know, you have to work with childcare and all of that. And you know, it's been really difficult because even though we don't have all those extra things to worry about, there's still the fact of housework has to get done, laundry has to get done, meals have to get cooked, day-to-day -day business of a household still has to get done. And I'm not there to pull my end of the deal, mm. but he's got to take up on it. And if there's so many times in the task force where you just see them making phone calls home. I'm sorry, honey. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. And it's like, Ooh, and the joke is usually, oh, I'm probably going to be divorced by the time I get home with him. I don't have to worry about it. He's always like, Hey, do what you got to do. I got everything here. And cause he knows what it's like. He's been in that position too. So it's nice to have career wise, someone who understands exactly what you're going through. So that's one of the benefits of the work we do. We can't, talk about the work we do, right? Right. But we can talk to each other. Right. And, exactly. you know, so, so when it, when we have those stressors and stuff, we're able to debrief as opposed to your first wife or, you know, right. yeah, she you was, can't bring it home. Right. Exactly. Or didn't want to hear it or mm -hmm. why can't you be here for this or that? And but Teresa I, not only understands it. And as she said, me being say a decade farther ahead of my career than she is, I've been through everything that she's doing and get it a hundred percent. And now I'm in the position, I'm a relative short timer, God willing, in four years, I'm done to figure out what I do when I grow up then. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm her biggest supporter mm -hmm. and she's got a lot of good mentors at work and I don't ever get in the way and interfere with that. But I try to be a sounding board for her at home. But it's a delicate balance too, because if you bring too much of work home, that can be detrimental too. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's times where he's like, okay, stop, no more work talk. Right. And, right. you know, it's very easy to take it home, especially since we work in the same agency, mm -hmm. all the little, you know, scuttlebutt that goes around. It's like, you know, he's the only person I can talk to really about it. And then it's, you know, it, it can become detrimental too. So, yeah. Yeah, we run into yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of, one of the things that you were talking about, Mike, is this concept we've kind of been putting together where, you know, what we our basic natural instinct really is to seek comfort, right? And so if you eat whatever you want or go to bed whenever you want, right, you, you get comfort, which brings you pleasure. And pleasure only lasts for the moment. And, and then it leaves a destruction, right? If you eat McDonald's all the time, sooner or later, you're going to be pretty sick or something, you know? And if you tend to the harder stuff, which requires discipline, like, oh, eyebrows are up, we're tending to this, or, you know, don't go to bed until, right. you know, we're relatively certain we're both on the same page. And, and that discipline, that actually leads to joy. And that kind of joy, it really feeds you for long periods of time whenever you push yourself to do something that's out of your comfort zone. Like you've done some uh, triathlons. 
Yes. Yeah. And a marathon. <laughs> and and you were not so comfortable in the water. Oh, no, I wasn't. The, <laughs> that was awesome to watch. Open water swimming was one of the, it's one of my favorite accomplishments I think I've ever done just because I'm a very strong swimmer in a pool and I had no idea what it was going to be like to be in open water swimming. And my first experience, I had a panic attack and I've never had panic oh. attacks before. Legit panic attack where I was like, <laughs> like I could not breathe. And Worked through it and he actually was a big help because he's like, because I'm like, he's, what, what can I do to help? I'm like, well, I just need to get in the open water swim. I need to do it on my own, on my own calendar, my own, my own schedule. And I work, I'm, I'm with a great triathlon group that's local and, you know, they're great people. And, but I'm like, I just, I need to be embarrassed by myself. I need to be able to work through it. I need someone who's going to be patient. And he jumped in his, in their kayak and, spend some time with me in the lake and I was able to work past it. And it was, it was fun because he was part of my triumph too. And it was like, after that, I accomplished it. I'm like, yeah, that was awesome. And now I can't get enough of open water. See, I can see that joy <laughs> in you right now. Yeah, you're talking yeah. about. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the only, I, I won't be triathloning with her. <laughs> <laughs> what did you guys learn from your families growing up about relationships? My mom was married previously and had two girls, um, my sister, Gina and Lisa. Her first husband just, he was not a great man and uh, left my mom with two young girls to raise by herself. And so my dad, my biological dad, I mean, he's the only dad I know, he basically stepped in and just accepted the fact that he was going to raise two girls. And then they had my sister, Michelle. And then 10 years later, I came along. My mom insists I was a happy surprise. I'm like, mom, I get it. I, I was the accident. <laughs> What's the age um, difference between her oldest and you? See, Gina is probably about 15, 16 years older than I am. Lisa is 13. And then Michelle is 10 years older than cool. I am. But it was... They have, I have, so I have two half sisters and then one biological sister. And we were raised in this blended family, so to speak. And I never knew that, I never considered my sisters anything other than my full sisters. My dad just stepped up to the plate and just was a, you know, he stepped up and raised two girls, his, just like they were his own. And he really became someone that I looked up to when it came to blending our own family. Mike has two kids from a previous, from his previous marriage. So, you know, there's been times where I've turned to my dad and I said, how did you do this? This is the <laughs> hardest thing I've ever had to do in my entire life. And my dad just, you know, was like, well, it's, that's the, that's part of the package. You just got to deal with it. And so it was, he, he taught me a lot about being strong, being there, putting the kids first. And my mom is just, when her first husband left her, she just is of the personality of, okay, well, how am I going to fix this? And she called up and she's a nurse and she asked for more shifts and enlists her mom, my grandmother, to help watch the kids. And she just didn't even think twice about it. Just, okay, what do I got to do? So both my parents are very hardworking and just put, you know, the family first. And, and that's kind of how I was raised is you just work you work hard and that's, that was it. I mean, there's no, no other way to do life than just work hard. And they've been together 40 some years. Yeah. That's yep. awesome. Yeah. yeah. You know, step parents, they step in and they step up and I think it's one of the most selfless things you can do. It's really, really, really awesome. Raise a stepdad too. I had a son before him and, and it, it's amazing because I don't think my son would be the person he is today without him. Yeah. Well, one thing I, I say to other step parents is that the role is a very different one than the bio role, oh, yes. right? Because it is a role of choice. You yeah. Know, once you are, you have a child. Your child, you are always going to be the father. You are always going to be the mother. But a step parent, you are choosing to take on that yeah, role. Yeah, for sure. Right, and so that's where the power of that relationship lies. Yeah. So even though you kind of grew up in a blended family structure and everything. You found yourself in the step parenting role, and then now you start seeing the challenges of it from the other side, yeah, right? History <laughs> repeating too. Yeah, right. <laughs> for sure. How about for you, Mike? So my parents, I am their only child together. My dad was married previously, so I have two half sisters. It's it's an interesting sort of opposite, more difficult dichotomy there because so my dad and his then high school sweetheart, she got pregnant. They got married, you know, sort of, quote, unquote, did the right thing. Had another girl. So my my two half-sisters, 
his wife at the time stepped out on him, divorced him. Mm. They are significantly older than me. I want to say 13 and 11 years older. So growing up, it was, it was sort of the Sunday, Sunday with the stepsisters, but they're much older than me. Yeah. And as I've gotten older, I would say w- one of my, well, let me back up. My, my parents have been married 50 years. They just celebrated 50 years together. Wow, awesome. that's great. Unlike Teresa's folks, my two half sisters have been kind of a constant lifelong challenge for my mom, mm-hmm. a little more uh, oppositional defiant and a little more needy in that they both had unsuccessful relationships, continued to turn back to my dad for financial assistance, for moving back in. And they've both had sort of jealousy with me thinking my parents have given me more. You know, I got hired in law enforcement at 22, all on my my own. You know, nobody hands you that job. And within two years, because I had the goal, I bought my first townhouse. You know, by say 24, I was living on my own. Neither of my two half sisters has ever owned anything. They've been renters their whole life, which is fine. That's no judgment, but they assume that I was able to achieve that because my parents gave me more. Mm -hmm. And there's always been, you know, nothing said, but the underlying, you know, monster bubbling there. And uh, my mom has had challenges. I mean, really to this day, with recent issues with one of my stepsisters more than the other with falling for various sweetheart type scams and just giving, being more of a, a, a emotional a, drain, emotional and financial mm-hmm. drain mm-hmm. It, yeah. and okay. where to the point where as recently as three years ago, his mom had to actually set boundaries and she's not very assertive woman and she had to set boundaries and it was, it was a challenging time in their marriage and it was kind of like, all right, you know, it's kind of badass that she's doing this, <laughs> but I, his, his sisters continue to, you know, provide that challenge for them. Mm-hmm. And, and and I think my mom and Teresa bonded initially. Absolutely. Uh, she was very supportive of Teresa for taking on my kids mm-hmm. that, you know, like any other kids, there was ups and downs. Mm-hmm. And she thanked me for saving your life. Truth. <laughs> truth. That is true. I was not headed in a good direction, but, uh, <laughs> You know, my parents have always worked very hard. My mom was a Chicago public school teacher. Mm-hmm. My dad was a second or third generation owner of a, a family hardware business that started in the 1920s on the west side of Chicago when that was all immigrant, Jewish, Irish, Italian. And when I was about, I want to say 18, you know, the neighborhood had just deteriorated to the point that it was time to get out, which frankly I was grateful for because I didn't want to be the next generation of hardware store owner. <laughs> My parents have been together and very strong. Like anyone else, I've I've learned likes and dislikes and uh, fortunate that Ter- Teresa has been, again, the strong one in, in taking on my kids. Because mm-hmm. my, my son... Love both my kids equally, but there's been that that dynamic of mother son, mm-hmm. father daughter. You know, my daughter is very much my my personality closer to me. She butts heads with her mom. My son and I love him to death, always there for him. But in the early days of our divorce, anytime he was over at our house, he would report everything back to mama oh, yeah. and whether there was any, there was nothing to report mm-hmm. and it was much more <laughs> active challenge to who Teresa was in my life and at seven eight nine you can't explain to an eight-year-old boy who's loyal to his mom that hey she's you know she's not your mom we get that but show you know this much respect mm-hmm. but did that know, have a long-term impact on them Aaron I don't think as much. Yeah, Ben my, definitely. Ben is more of a 
very emotional, very um, sensitive kid. Nurturer. He's, He's very a much a nurturer. Mm-hmm. Aaron is more of a, you know, she's a headstrong girl. She's like her dad. She's like me. She's just, you know, she plows through challenges and doesn't, you know, think much. Yep. Not much affects her as far as emotional. You know, she's she's just she's just who she is. I water her off a duck's back. You yeah, know? my my daughter who is very much like me. Now, I, I've gotten to the point I have a very good relationship with my ex because we've always raised the. Everything has been just for the kids. 100%. Mm-hmm. You know, united front for the kids. Yes. Even if we had a disagreement, it was, okay, we're going to talk about it for what's best for the kids. And she's, mm-hmm. she jokes with me as my daughter has become this young woman, you know, that my kids will be 18 in May. She's joked like, your daughter is just like you. She's emotionally dead. I cry <laughs> at TV shows and she laughs at me. And, <laughs> <laughs> Whereas, yeah, my son is much more of whether he was aware or not, he took on the man of the house role looking out for mama. Mm-hmm. And I, I love him for that, for, mm-hmm. you know, stepping up. Yeah, we are close, but it, my, my son is a, a man of few words in general. And so love. And teenager <laughs> on top of it all. So. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. how old were the kids when you became a step parent? Six. Six. Six and years old. So they're twins? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. okay. And then how old were you? Oh, I was, 20. shoot, I was like 26 maybe? 26. Yeah, somewhere around there. Okay. We're yeah. married 11 years, so. Uh, math. Yeah, right. <laughs> we, were, we were told there'd be no math today. <laughs> are they, like, are they 17? <laughs> uh, yeah, they'll be There's 18 in, yeah, in May. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. yeah, 11 years, yeah. And I will say, you know, in there, there has been struggles. There's been definitely yeah. struggles. Um, I've never really felt close to my stepdaughter until she became a teenager. And she ironically got a phone and she will text me just the other day. She's like, oh my God, the best news ever, which of course, everything is the best news ever. But she <laughs> meddled in one of her track meets and she, you know, so she'll share those things with me. And with uh, my stepson, it's not so much the same. He, he's, you know, uh, distance, you know, always kept me at arm's length. And, you know, I think that is because he's loyal to his mom and, and she and I have a decent relationship. We're not calling each other up to have coffee, but you know, if we're at a, inter, you know, a, a school meet with the kids or there's something with the kids, you know, she's always very cordial to me, you know, we'll sit and we'll talk and it's not like it's, you know, uncomfortable. It's, it's, not the best, but it's, you know, she's, but it's, it's works and the kids see that. And that's the most important part is that they see that we're all a united front. Mm-hmm. And there's been challenges where, you know, we've come forward and we said, Hey, listen, I know I'm not your mom. I don't want to be your mom. I'm, I'm not, I'm not that person, but I am an adult and I do have your best interests at heart. And you will respect me as an adult in your life and know that I love you and everything that I choose, you know, I say, or your dad says, you know, it's coming from a place of love and it's coming from something that we want to support you. And that's always been the message that we've had. And it's, it's, it's been great, even in times where our stepson has had some struggles and it was not the funnest thing. He had to write a uh, essay. This one thing that sticks in my head. He had to write an entrance essay to his high school and he had to write about a challenge and he wrote about his parents divorce and in it he wrote, he wrote that my stepmom is not my favorite person <laughs> so that was oh. a little bit of a <sighs> was a little bit yeah. of a gut punch but at the yeah. same time i understand where he's coming from i mm-hmm. wouldn't i you know he went through a very traumatic experience and he was being honest and i have to honor that honesty and i have to you know it's like okay thank you for communicating that even if it wasn't directly to me because now i understand where you're coming from and i'm not going to push you into anything. I'm going to let you naturally progress and realize. And one of the things that has always saved me, and one thing, especially that Mike had said in the the peak of the difficult situation was this is all temporary, number one. Mm -hmm. This is all temporary, financial, you know, everything else, all temporary. And the second thing was eventually... As I did growing up, seeing my parents' relationship and my sister's relationship with their biological father, eventually you will come to understand, they will come to understand what this is all about. You can't be mad at a 10, 12-year-old for not understanding complex adult relationships and how everything happened. And eventually when they get older and they get their own relationships, they will see, hey, wait a minute, 
she really sacrificed a lot for me. My parents really did a lot for me. And so that's kind of been my saving grace Mm -hmm. where it's like, I felt really terrible and like, oh, you know, I I really want to have that, you know, stepmom relationship like Julia Roberts in that movie. (laughs) But it's a movie. Exactly. (laughs) It's a movie. And eventually I will have that when they get older. But, you know, at that point, it's I got to be a parent. I got to be, you know, uh, let him handle the majority of everything. And if something makes me uncomfortable, something makes me angry, communicate it to him and trust that he will address the issue with his his ex and the kids. So I'm glad you have that perspective because I don't think many step parents are able to see that. Yeah. That, you know, those rewards are going to come in on the back end. My stepson's 31 now, He's married, they're in DC, he works on Capitol Hill. Mm-hmm. And we have a stronger relationship than he he does with his bio dad. Right. You know, which is amazing. It's really awesome. When did that when did that shift for you that you started to feel? I, I think that once he started to date and date Angie. So now he's his, his wife. So that was how many years so ago? He was like 22. Yeah, something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I remember you guys would have some pretty intense conversations. Oh, no, yeah. You? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to work through. But, but it's hard, you know, it's hard right. to work through it. Yeah. And it really is. It's, it's not, it, like I right. said, it's the hardest thing I've ever had to do is bite my lip. And ooh, there was also another, <laughs> another in the, in the apex of, of our, the difficult part of it. I remember yelling at him and he's like, what do you want me to do? What, what do you want me to do? I can't control this situation. Mm-hmm. And I said, you need to understand that you are in the front seat of this bus along with your ex. I am in the trailer in the back. I'm not even in the same car. I just have to go wherever you're going. And I have no decisions. I I don't... I'm like, my only input is you, you know? And so you need to understand where I'm coming from that I want to control this situation. That's my personality. That's who I am. Mm -hmm. And I can't. But you can't, right? Right. Yeah. And there were some some harder times, some difficult days where I heard her 100%, but... It's sort of that, how do I choose between my children? And they're wrong, mm-hmm. but they're not going to understand that Teresa, who I've chosen to spend the rest of my life with, is right and explain it in the right way. Mm-hmm. And for the most part, my my ex, I mean, really, she she's stayed out of our business. Mm-hmm. We've, we've remained, like I said before, united front and... I think has come to appreciate not only Teresa, but Teresa's parents have really taken the kids on as they love them to death. We have a running joke that her parents are the kids' favorite grandchildren (laughs) or grandparents (laughs) rather (laughs) does help. They have a house in Phoenix with a swimming pool in their backyard (laughs) where we go for spring break every year. But do you think your dad being more for whatever his motivations were of how he was with his daughters and probably didn't, set firm enough boundaries. Do you think that impacted you as an ex-husband and a dad? Yes, for sure. And in fact, my mom has complimented me on what a good parent I am and working Teresa in and focusing on her because my my dad, I think it was a different era of parenting, a different mm-hmm. different time where he just went to work and came home and had dinner and he was a Sunday dad. You know, it was the Sundays or we're going to do something fun. And I, I went through that for a brief, the divorce dad guilt, you know, maybe the first year before I had the epiphany. Every Sunday doesn't, you know, I mean, I had my kids more than Sundays, but our time together doesn't have to be fun because if we were still married, life isn't always fun. Right. And it took me probably about a year of that, again, that inherent guilt to realize, no, this is ridiculous. Sometimes we're just going to be just like as if we all lived under the same roof. I think I did set more boundaries. And when I had to lay down, you know, not always, not always. And it, and it took Teresa's help to sometimes, you know, hit me in the head to realize, no, you need to stand up as a father and realize your kids can't be right. Mm -hmm. You push through the guilt. Yes, Mm -hmm. absolutely. And my, um, I I take it with pride that my mom has said she, you know, she's proud of the job we, Teresa and I have done together, but what a father I've become 
and set boundaries and things that my father never did. Mm-hmm. Well, and it's also important to recognize your sacrifices as well. I mean, he's done a lot in far as personal time. There's there's so many times where, you know, just in the job, we see generally speaking, you know, dads who don't want to spend time with their kids or moms who, you know, oh, you can have them this weekend. I don't want them this weekend, you know, and they they put themselves first. And there's a time period there. His kids live an hour away in Chicago. And there was a time oh, wow. period where his son just had issues where he was uncomfortable staying overnight in our house. And Mike had to, he would go pick up the kids, bring them back. So that's two hours. And then he would drop his, his, he would drive his son back home and then he would come back. And then the next morning he would drive, pick up his son, bring him back and then drive back to Chicago. When, wow. When that was Chicago. probably about wow. two years. Yeah. And that was two years of that. And just his willingness to do that, his, his, you know, just instead of being like, instead of forcing his son to stay overnight or just mm-hmm. say, no, you know what, just stay home with your mother. He really made the effort to make him comfortable and to let his son, you know, deal with things on his own, on his own. And there was a lot of that. There's a lot of unselfish love there. And that is another reason why I love him so much. I came to love him so much is that he gives Aww. so much. I know. <laughs> oh, mushy. Who yeah. said I love you first? I don't know. I don't know. I bet you did. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably right. I moved in with my garbage bags full of stuff forever. I love you, Lenny. No, yeah. but what matters is we don't go a day without saying I love you, yeah. without meaning it. And that's really important. And we always, we have our own, we've developed over the years, we've developed our own language, which I'm sure people, if they ever heard us say anything to, you know, each other, they'd be like, what the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> and uh, we have our own nicknames. Like I call him David because uh, we were on our honeymoon and the, we <laughs> we went on a cruise and the waitress kept calling him David for whatever reason. <laughs> and so now, so then I just wound up calling him David. And so when we're in Target or we're in, you know, wherever grocery store, I'm like, hey, David. <laughs> and our friends, they, they're they like, his, he's not David. Are you, what's going on? Why are you calling him another man's name? I'm and like, I no, reflexively no. will look if she's like, hey, Dave, <laughs> but Dave, David, Dave. <laughs> he'll call me that too. So that's the weird thing about it. Yeah. It's not like a mushy, a mushy, uh, what was the Seinfeld one? Schmoopy. Schmoopy, it's schmoopy Dave. Yeah. yeah. We call each other Dave. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's really cool. We actually have our couples create different names for each other to kind of, you know, signify when they they flip that switch and they're now and they're like angry. Oh, that's definitely David. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, it is. The formal when it goes formal, David. Yeah, no joke. Yeah. So how did you guys, you know, with the schedules that you you have in law enforcement and then balancing a a new blended family. How, how did you guys manage that? Magic. <laughs> I don't even know. Right. Yeah, well, it was a lot harder in the beginning, I will yeah. say, because so taking a step back, we were, we tried to keep our relationship on the down low from our coworkers. Oh, yeah. For six mm. months, it was best mm. kept secret. Yes. And then once it broke, you know, it was big drama, big news. Sure. And between, okay, uh, we had a running joke now that people who bet on our marriage should have taken the over because right. we beat the line. <laughs> you know, a lot of people who lost a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but in the beginning, there there was another couple, another married couple at our workplace that were kind of openly mocked because they felt entitled. They should always work yeah. together. And we prided ourselves on being the anti version of them mm. and being all business at work, all business. Still to this day. Yes. And have, I would say for the 13 years or whatnot, we've been together carrying that off successfully to the point that when we first got together, Teresa was in one division of the agency, you know, uniform patrol, and I was in investigations. Mm -hmm. Completely different hours. It was a non-issue. Then I was returned to, you know, the same place as Teresa. We're both in patrol. I did not want to be her direct boss. So we chose literally to work. Opposite. Not only opposite shifts, but 
I volunteered to go on straight nights. Ouch. She was on straight days. Wow. At that time, I was on straight nights. We did straight All, nights on opposite op- shifts so when for I, the wh- first two years of our marriage. Yeah, so when I was off, she was working and vice versa. So for us to literally have a night out or to go grocery shopping, yeah. uh, one of us was burning benefit time, uh, you know, comp time, yeah. a vacation day, whatnot. I remember seeing my friend at the time. She was posting on Facebook. She's like, oh, I'll go out for coffee with the hubs. I'm like, oh, I want to I want to do that. <laughs> like, but that also, so when we, when we switched and we made it a little bit easier for ourselves and we, you know, I went to day shift, he went to night shift. We were on the same days off rotation. It became a lot easier, but it kind of was a good thing for us because we never took it for granted. We mm-hmm. never, you know, it's, it's. It's like it was, dating while you're married. Yeah, yes. exactly. Yeah. You never yeah. take it for granted. And I think we've always joked we have just we're both very independent still. <laughs> um so <laughs> we always understatement. <laughs> yes. So we joke that just enough time together, yeah. just enough apart. That's and why we stayed married so long. Yeah. I mean <laughs> we, we have stretched it we out. We certainly yeah. <laughs> have friends in common, mm-hmm. but there's never any issue if okay, I'm stuck at work. She wants to go out with a friend. I don't care, you know, I don't need a where did you go? What did you do? And it's the same mm-hmm. vice versa. Like currently, you know, she's got one set of hours that are basically daytime hours. January 1st of last year, I got promoted to a new position, which I lost. The good news is, hey, congratulations. You got a nice promotion with more responsibility and pay that's commensurate, which I had wanted, but I lost the ability to choose my hours. No. So it went from a union position where based on my seniority, I could work whenever and wherever I chose to guess what? This year you're on nights, next year you're on days, repeat. Yeah. So, and I, no complaints about it. That's mm-hmm. just is what it is. So Teresa's on basically daytime hours. I'm on nights for all of 2019. So we have days, some days off in common, but otherwise... He's still on, yeah, we're still on different schedules. He's got a different sleep schedule than I do. Mm-hmm. And I will say, though, that you being on nights is my favorite part because I get the bed to myself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we get to hog the bed separately <laughs> to the fact that, like, this weekend I'm off, she's off, and it's a little bit of, oh, man, we got to share the bed? Yeah. <laughs> so tell us a story about how you guys got engaged. Oh, that was... Well, yeah, it's really uneventful. So <laughs> my, 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 we got together in the midst of my divorce, finally ended. My divorce took uh, a little over a year, 14, 16 months. We've been, we had been together a year and a half at that point. I knew that as soon as the divorce was over, we were going to get married. You know, what, what do you call it? A, the ultimate rebound or not? I knew, <laughs> I knew this was more than you know, a roommate, this was more than a, a bounce back. I, let's just say because of some poor choices I made, I had worked the field a bit the, the years prior. I knew she was, she was the one. So literally on my way home from the daily center, cause my, my divorce was in Chicago mm-hmm. on the way home from the daily center, the finalization of the divorce, call it old school, call it respectful, whatever. I called her dad and asked permission to marry her wow. on the way home from the divorce being finalized. Wow. What did and, he say? Uh, <laughs> My dad's a man her, of very few words. Her dad is super <laughs> chill. Um, and I had to overcome some some traditional, her dad, without going in a totally different direction, uh, you know, her dad was not happy that we were living together, oh, not being no. married. Oh, no. Oh, okay. To the uh, point where my mom said, this is her house. If you don't like it, we can get a hotel room. Yeah. When they were visiting. <laughs> yeah. So that's another story. <laughs> but I don't remember how much longer it was after that. And coming fresh off a of divorce, I wasn't exactly flush with cash. <laughs> but like it was my goal. I was proud. I was saving money to buy a ring mm-hmm. to do all that. And I had finally bought a ring and I don't think I even did it purposely. We were, went out to dinner at, um, Bob Chins. Thank you. Welcome. Um, <laughs> to Bob Chins. And I had the ring with me, but I wasn't sure if I was gonna have the guts to do it. 
and we were walking in and it was just one of those like, hey, wait a minute. And I got down on one knee outside of the, the entrance to Bob Chen. People are walking by us. Yep. And we got, <laughs> it, you know, like people probably have way cooler, more elaborate. I was not the guy like follow clue A to tip B. To, yeah, it was, yeah, it was probably not a complete shock that it was coming. No. It was more of just when. So, yeah, he proposed. And then, of course, I said yes. And then we stood in line, as you have to, and Bob Chins. And they sat us down. And we actually had our favorite waiter at the time because we would go there every now and again. And uh, we told him, we're like, hey, we're engaged. He goes, oh, congratulations. He brought us the cake that we, I think we had to pay for. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, we're happy for you. This but is going to be $19 <laughs> extra. But it was, uh, it, was, it was so us, though. You know, it, it just, mm-hmm. you know, just the way we are. It was really no frills. No, I didn't, I, you know, I, I'm not the type of girl who wants it in front of, you know, the entire Wrigley Field Stadium mm-hmm. or anything like that. And it was, you know, it was, it was comical because we had people walking by us and no one really was like fawning over us and oh congratulations it was just like it was very real it was very Mm -hmm. realistic very real world and it was just kind of like hey all right well this is what it is and it it, it's kind of symbolic of us because we're not big planners no (laughs) we're not big plan like you know how long have we been trying to do this podcast yeah Yeah, exactly (laughs) and now hearing your stories yeah Yeah. this is a very uh Symbolic. Good. It was a really, you guys sacrificed a lot just to come and do this. Right. This is your one day off. Well, it's that you, the yeah. weekend, weekend, weekend. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. but uh, sorry, kids. it's your personal time. Is, yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, kids. We got a thing. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we're, we're pretty spontaneous. One of our closest friends is uh, a huge planner <laughs> and it's taken her probably five years to finally realize she no longer asks us. She just does it. Yeah. She's like, Hey, you're both off such and such date. Okay, we're going to do this because our thing is like, I don't know, we'll figure out what we're going to do. And it drives and, her insane. Right. And we usually wind up having like, you know, it's sort of that inherent when you plan stuff out too much, there's inherent pressure for it to mm-hmm. be perfect. Right. Yeah. yeah. And us, some of the greatest times we've had are just spontaneous. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so that's that's our life really in a nutshell. Yeah. yeah, spontaneity. Yeah. You know, you'd be surprised that when we ask the, that question about getting engaged, we don't hear like this pomp and circumstance mm-hmm. stories, mm-hmm. really. And well, our engagement pretty- was very much the same way. It yeah, was we private. On it was the floor in our living room. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What is something that your partner has said to you that was really meaningful, and you really understood that they knew you and they helped you heal something because they said that? I don't know if it's a specific thing, but post-divorce, during divorce, I carried a lot of guilt over how I handled my my old marriage kind of going chilly and falling apart and me certainly doing my part towards <laughs> expediting that. I lived a couple of years pretty much a reckless bachelor lifestyle, lifestyle despite being married and you know, like you had alluded to, you know, that was just putting a Band-Aid on the hurt. Mm-hmm. Despite the success at work, inside, I was I was feeling pretty crappy about who I was as a person. And Teresa's constant support and assuring me that I wasn't the, you know, the screw-up that, that I, I really felt I was. You know, she built me up and built me up and helped me realize that, no, you know, life happens and you know, reminded me that it takes two people to make a relationship work or fail. The blood isn't all on your hands. It's not all because of your actions. Really gave me the confidence to to not only get over that, but truly to help me rebuild into the person that I am today. You know? Wow. Truly. I, I, I've always been a bit of a, uh, you know, professionally, I think if you're good at what you do within law enforcement, you've got to be a bit of an alpha. You don't have to be mm-hmm. a jerk, but you know, as I, as I tell young guys that work for me now, even if you don't know what the, what the hell you're doing when you roll up to something, you better carry yourself like you do. Mm-hmm. Cause when people call the police, they're looking for a solution. Right. More of that leader type. Yes. Yeah. And like, you know, I, Teresa described my quote unquote command presence. I, I would not be comfortable saying that about me, but that, I don't take crap from people, but I'm I'm low key, and I think Teresa helped me really get back to 
the feeling that that's not an act just for work. That is who I am. Mm-hmm. You know, okay. okay, that's enough filler. Now it's your turn. <laughs> so, some of the things I say <laughs> to women is, you know, it, it usually is women that are stronger, make men better. I, and I know I'm going to be in so much trouble one day for saying that out loud. I, I, I have no it's disagreement so for that. Well, I like what he said earlier. Weak men seek out weak women. Right. I, I am 100% right. behind that. Yeah. And I will say that I agree with that because it's a strong woman who helps a man be strong but at the same time it's a strong man who helps a woman be strong it's it's a I think it's a the strong man who helps a woman become soft yeah yeah I, th- that, I think ooh, that's good too. I think a word is synergy yeah I was gonna <laughs> say that too I wanted to say that but I didn't know if I'd get bonus points for that <laughs> We should I, ring the bell every time we work right, synergy use the word synergy. In. Synergy. Or like in Pee Wee's Playhouse, ah, word of the day, ah, everybody goes crazy. <laughs> and that's why I love her because we've got a Pee Wee's Playhouse reference. <laughs> Obscure is my specialty. I would say for me, and I mentioned it before, is in in the the climax of, and that's a terrible word. That's and an a, and, excellent <laughs> word. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> in the in the worst part of you know our the whole trying to manage the the blended family and the the control part of things is when he told me it's all temporary everything is temporary everything is going to change and that has kind of become my mantra as of late and you know there's a lot of work stress in my position and you know there's a lot of a lot of things he says to me especially lately just going through all the stress that I'm going through and just all the changes and there's a ton of stuff that I just, I get so worried and so pent up about that he's, he's my sounding board. He's the person I go to. And he says a lot of things that help bring me back down to earth, that help me really focus. And so that was one of the biggest things was it's all temporary. So no matter what you're going through, no matter how bad you think it may be, eventually it's going to change. Nothing stays constant. And so that is always something that I always kind of come back to is, is that, you know, that's, that's the one thing I knew that made me click, that made me realize, yeah, you might be right about something, but. Wow. <laughs> Gentlemen, write that down. She said I might be right. <laughs> do you guys, do you guys ever worry about each other's safety because of your jobs? We have a bit of a tradition. I wouldn't say actively. I don't worry about her. Just like I, I think if you're really good at what you do to stay sane in our field, you can't go to work every day worrying about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So every night, especially being on opposite shifts, we'll text each other. I love you. Be safe. And we have a joking saying, "Just this goes back to some lawsuit we read about years ago about some cop who got sued punching somebody that was handcuffed. Mm-hmm. So it's always... Which is a big no-no. Yeah. So I always <laughs> really? say, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I love you. Be safe. Don't, Don't punch. punch. Don't punch. That's, and so they're, they're, they reply back to the other is forever. You know, I love you forever. Be safe. Always. Don't punch. Never. Never. (laughs) So that's literally, that's our thing. Every night being on opposite shifts, we send that to each other. And I think we have forever, always, never. That's our, those three words. That's cool. And I think we also have the benefit of knowing who, who is the backup, knowing, you know, we're all trained similarly. We're all, you know, we, we have defensive tactics and, and there comes a certain point where, you can't let yourself worry about that because if you did, you would just stress yourself out. And mm-hmm. so I have the confidence in him to know that he would be able to hold his own. He is able to, you know, do whatever he needs to do to come home safe to me. And I, you know, I'm sure he trusts me to do the same. And so that's that's one of those things like it's always there's always the unwritten fear, but at the same time you can't let it worry you too much and I just know he's going to do what he needs to do. And he, he knows that I'm going to be a scrappy little fighter if I need to be. So (laughs) (laughs) what is it that your partner does that lets you know they love you? Oh, the little things all the time. He does all of the laundry. (laughs) (laughs) He cleans the kitchen. Um, OCD pays off. <laughs> he he handles everything. I mean, he really does. And I think it's more the fact that he's more impatient that he doesn't want to wait me for me to do it. But he takes care of me, and he he makes sure that everything that I need is there. He makes sure that I'm taken care of. He just uh, uh, just the little things. The little things is how I know he loves me. 
Does he wash your Jeep? Yes. Oh my God. He is. <laughs> I might be. I might. If it weren't for detailing cars, I might be uh, institutionalized by now. That's my therapy. <laughs> that is my therapy. He has. I can't even tell you how many cleaning supplies we have in our garage. <laughs> he, if you want paint correction, you want to know how to detar, debug anything. He's got the thing for it. It, Reach out to Ray and Jean if you need a car uh, <laughs> detailed. We can work something out. I think you found your second uh, career. <laughs> yes, right. It's 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 a bit uh, a little bit insane, but at least I know when I see the water beating off of my windshield and I don't have to turn my windshield wipers on. I, it's his little hug to me. <laughs> and for your listeners, these these guys are avid Jeep owners, and <laughs> that's right, Jeep life, like spectacular vehicles. <laughs> <laughs> Might be a problem. <laughs> not a, if it's not a problem if you don't admit it is and and i will say that anytime we go off-roading and i insist on off-roading without the top or without the doors and when i see a mud puddle he just hangs his head and he's like <laughs> oh there goes five hours of my life that you're about to go into that so, mud puddle so really you just saved him like eight hundred dollars in therapy yeah. exactly <laughs> it doesn't oh. do you guys any good for job <laughs> job uh <laughs> security but right. yes uh well, there's no psychotropic drugs here it's more carnauba <laughs> wax and yeah, <laughs> ceramic <laughs> sealer yes while he saved i saved him eight hundred dollars in therapy he spent eight hundred dollars in detailing supplies yeah. so i don't know well, everybody, everybody we actually wins. charge cops a little bit more because uh, having them on the couch is a little bit more of a oh, challenge yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't know and, for a minute and right less more more difficult lawyers Oh yeah. Oh yeah. We've had Definitely. lawyers, Mary lawyers. Oh my god, that's the worst. They're all in their head. All up here. <laughs> I, I believe that one. Always gotta argue. Always yeah. gotta be right. That's their job, you know? Yeah. And when I'm thinking I'm just gonna keep internal because I still have to deal with attorneys for work. So. <laughs> <laughs> so what is it that she does that lets you know she loves you? I would say everything. The way she looks at me, the way she takes her hand. Johnny. Uh the way she the things she does for me every day, the support. She's my biggest fan. I make the bed for you. Most of the time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just everything. I just, I feel it without being said. And she says it every day. I'm like Teresa mentioned earlier, the I love yous every day. And it's not just saying it, you know, as you know, your listeners can't see it. But as she's talking, Teresa has a habit of tearing up. Her eyes well up with passion. I hate it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. She's a terrible poker player. Um, (laughs) But I saw it as we were sitting here. That's okay. I have the same thing. Talking about (laughs) us, I saw her well up, and it's because it's genuine. You're going to make me do it again. Stop it. (laughs) (laughs) She's my best friend. And it's, you know, law enforcement being a male dominated society. She has it extra difficult, and it kills me when I hear, you know, a majority of my coworkers doing put it on this Neanderthal show about complaining about their wives, bitching about their wives, and all. I think is she's legit my my best friend. There's oh, hundred percent. There's nobody I'd rather spend time with. Yeah, you know, if nothing else, that's she is legit my my best friend on this planet. For sure. And uh, I think it, just as important as I love you is I miss you. And, you know, that that too is, I think, such an underused phrase, especially in marriage, because, you know, it's it's normal to miss somebody you love. And I think that even if there's times where, you know, we've got a lot of stuff going on. And even though, like, if we go to, whether it's a family party or we're together, but we're not interacting with each other, if it's not just a one-on-one thing... You know, there's times where we could be sitting in the same room for, you know, two or three days watching Netflix or whatever. But for him to turn to me and say, I miss you, it means something completely different. It means, you know, you know, it's 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 something that's hard to describe. But to know that he wants to be with me, to that that I'm his best friend, that I'm his person is mm is how I know he loves me. It's and we we constantly text every day. I mean, there's always, you know, oh my gosh, you know, this happened or oh, by the way, you know, I got you your vitamins at Target or you know, just stupid little stuff throughout the day and just knowing that I can tell him those stupid things and he's actually interested, which I don't know how he is, but 
but you know, it's, it's, it's important for that. I think yeah. is to, to want to share in the life of the other person. You guys have been in other relationships before. Mm-hmm. Is there something about this relationship that you somehow knew was different and special? A friendship, hundred percent. Friend, friendship and the honesty from almost like our first say dinner out, out, just sharing past experiences, being completely honest and, in my case, I would say owning my my warts and all. Mm-hmm. You know, I made no secret that, yeah. like, when we first got together, yeah, personally, I was a bit of a train wreck. And I owned it because, frankly, I was tired of lying. And it was like, good, mm-hmm. bad, or otherwise, like, this is it. Here's who I am. Mm-hmm. And she accepted and shared her own stories as well. I think also respect I respect him as an individual as well as my partner. I know that he's going to go through his hard times. I know that he's going to go through different growth processes. I know that he's going to, he's a human being to expect him to stay the same or to, you know, do anything that, that isn't going to change is, is kind of ridiculous. If you think about it is not to expect your partner to change. And it's my job to just stay with him and to encourage him to grow. And that was part of our wedding vows is to encourage each other to grow and to change because that's what a human being should do. Mm-hmm. And to always, I think another core tenant of our marriage is we always choose each other, no matter what it is, no matter what we face he is always the first person that I choose and I always will come home to him. And that's this, I think this, I don't want to speak for him, but it's the same thing. hundred percent. Yeah. Is that, that's, that's something we agreed upon way before we got married is I will always choose you. I will always respect you as a human being and as an individual. And that's one of the reasons why I think we have such a strong marriage. And, and allows for the independent streaks that we each have that. Cause you ain't ever going to keep that, get that out of us. <laughs> no, no. So I don't worry about where she is, what she does when she's out and vice versa. Cause you don't have to. Right. Because, okay. I trust her implicitly. I know where her, and most importantly, where her heart and loyalty is. Mm-hmm. You 100% know, loyal. there's so many people in this world that it's constant. Where are you with? Who are you with? What do you, blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. We have friends, you know, that, I mean, honestly, uh, we have so many friends that we hear stories out of their their relationships or their stories. And if I had a dollar for every time I said, thank God, that's not us. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> like, who knew that we would be the same sounding boards? Right. Mm-hmm. I'm sure if we had way more time, you could do another thesis mm-hmm. on us. But, oh. <laughs> uh, but relative to, you know, just common and, and issues you know too, we that- hear. This is because you guys created this right. and people create the other stuff as well. Right. Absolutely. Right. And, and the culture of where you guys work does not foster that. No. I mean, we're working with a, a cop couple right now that they have to, they, they track each other's phone. Like yeah. where and that's more, I would say based on our experience, certainly mine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's far more common than the, the, the security and the trust that we mm-hmm. have. You know, the, isn't it? Isn't it wonderful though? That it is. Yes. Trust. And and I pe- I think people don't understand that it's like you could seek the comfort, but it doesn't really feed you. But when you have this, right. you can really flourish. Hundred yeah. percent. And and it's we've gone through a lot of situations where there have been challenges. There have been people who have said, "Oh, well, she was out doing this," and there's always people who not necessarily have malicious intent, but they always try and sabotage and, or they'll, they'll bring out a piece of information that, you know, especially at work, you see, oh, well, you know, Mike was, was, oh, I saw Mike at the, you know, Starbucks and he was flirting with the barista. And it's like, okay, first of all, I know my husband and that's not the case. But second, if I had a real issue with it, I'd ask him and be like, hey, you know, so-and-so right. said they saw this. And then he would be able to say, well, no, you know, she was, Whatever. Whatever. She knows yeah. I'm inherently an extrovert and I, I'm a natural flirt, as is she. But it's harmless. It, it's exactly yeah. it's not I I never have any fear that her being her, which is part of what I fell in love with, doesn't bring jealousy. I mm-hmm. know that's just her character. Right. And yeah. it's a lot of work. <laughs> it, 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 it is seems, a lot of work. It sometimes it seems like it's effortless, but it's really not. I mean, there's no, it's constant when, investment. Yes. And when when it was funny that earlier when you had asked me the question about you know looking back on the kids and all that stuff, it's like 
look back and I'm like, wow, that's really exhausting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's really exhausting just the the amount of work that we've been through and the things that we've been through as a couple. It's like you look back on it and you're like, wow, you know, when you reflect back on it, it's it's insane how hard it is to to stay married. Mm-hmm. Everybody thinks that it's easy yeah. to do and it is not. It's it takes constant work oh, by yes. both. Right. Absolutely. We we always talk about relationships as like a bank account. Mm-hmm. And the times you spend together enjoying each other's company is the deposits. Mm-hmm. The times you spend stressed out or apart or in right. conflict or withdraws. Right. It's really hard to get those deposits in when you got little kids mm-hmm. and opposite, opposite shift jobs. Shifts, yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. the, that, those little textings, that goes a long way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Those little touch points. A penny at a time. Yeah. I, I would say <laughs> people have the money. Sorry, I'm going to offend probably 90% of your audience here. But <laughs> people have the money through Friday nine to five jobs. No idea. Yeah. No, no, and it, and, sure. and and we'd probably kill each other <laughs> if we were home together <laughs> seven but, nights a week. But we see those all the time. And one of the very first questions we ask them is, "How much quality time do you guys spend together? No screens, <gasps> just the two of you." And it's none. It is zero. Everything's right. zero. And they and they do same shifts, right? But they and I, I think checked be, out because this is all we know. This is our frame of reference. Mm-hmm. We inherently value our time together. You know, and every time we're off together doesn't mean we're together. There may be times where she's like, oh, I'm going out with so, her girlfriend or, you know, like I'm going out with my buddy or whatnot, you know, respecting each other's independence, but never putting anyone truly before the other. But I will say early on, what we did was we made each other a priority. So when we did have very limited time we wouldn't schedule girls' nights out or guys' nights mm-hmm. out during the time that we knew we would be together. Mm-hmm. It was always a priority to spend time together, whether it was just cooking a meal at home or going out for dinner. We always made sure that, and even to this day, even though now we have more time, especially the kids are older and they're spending more time with their friends, we still, it just it just became a habit and inherent. Like, okay, well, my girlfriends asked me the other day, hey, you want to go out Friday? And I looked at my calendar. I'm like, yeah, actually, that's a really good night because Mike is working. Mm -hmm. Even though he wouldn't have minded if it was a night that he wasn't working, it's still something that I would have been like, well, can we plan for the next Friday? Because then Mm -hmm. Mike would be working. So we always still very much make each other a priority in a lot of things. And I think that's important, too. Absolutely. That was really awesome, guys. You guys are an awesome couple. (laughs) You guys really are. (laughs) Our brand of dysfunction, we put the fun in dysfunction. (laughs) (laughs) We we want to thank you so much for being on the podcast today. This has been quite a joy. Well, thanks for having us. This a long time in the planning. Yeah. Mostly on our end, putting it off. (laughs) You know, people have been sharing stories for thousands of years to bond and to heal and to grow. And we hope that by you guys sharing your story, it's enriched your lives and the lives of our listeners. Yeah. That's why, that's one of the big reasons why we wanted to share is, you know, if we can help somebody else, then great. Thank you. That's awesome. All right. Thanks for having us. Thank you. For all you listening, if you have any questions or topic suggestions, again, please feel free to leave a comment or look us up online at couplesynergy.com. Until next time, synergize your life, synergize your love. You have been listening to Couple Synergy with Dr. Ray and Jean Kedkodian. Couple Synergy was recorded, edited, and produced by Dr. Ray and Jean Kedkodian, along with Organizational Director Calvin Javier and Marketing Coordinator Bridget Reese. Voiceover and music entitled Breathe and Let Go was recorded and composed by Gina Gonzalez.